I'm going to give you a very quick little intro. You feel free to, you know, correct and, you know, uh, expand. But John is a reporter. He's been uh, uh, living in Colombia for the better part of 15 years. 20. 20. Oh, that. You know, uh, it's kind of like that. And uh, he's been covering a lot of uh, South America. He's, he's covered lots of things. He has a great book, The Law of the Jungle. It's a, it's a good read um, about a rescue operation of American contractors, security contractors that were trapped in Colombia um, by the FARC. So there's a lot of things that I hope he's going to get to, you know, talk to people afterwards about in the Q&A, but this talk is going to focus on Venezuela, and that's really why we brought him here today. He's been covering, I guess for lack of a better term, you know, the collapse of the Venezuelan um, state over the last few years, and he's also been covering the Colombian peace process that's been going on. And I wanted to bring him here for this talk because it's very clear that the Venezuelan um, shifts have changed a lot of things in Florida themselves, and I know that I have a lot of Venezuelan students um, in every single one of my classes, and I really wanted to bring somebody who was on the ground um, covering stuff that's going on and, and, you know, was even, like, writing pieces for NPR and Time and um, PRI's The World as recently as the first week of this year, right, um, as well. So without further ado, y'all didn't come here to see me. John, please come on up. Well, um, nice to see everybody here. I guess it's your first class, right? <laughs> a long vacation, so I'm impressed that so many people showed up. There. <laughs> um, uh, thanks a lot, Rosanna. Thanks, Phil. Thanks for being to Florida for inviting me here. It's, it's very nice to be here. Um, uh, I do get to Venezuela a lot. Um, how many of you folks here are from Venezuela? Then <laughs> <laughs> you ought to be lecturing me. Not sure what I'm doing up here. Um, <clears throat> but I, I do get there a lot, um, mainly doing uh, reporting stories for NPR. Um, I've been going there for a long time, since 1997, when Rafael Caldera was still president. Um, and, uh, you know, these days I get all kinds of questions, as you guys probably do too, you know. What the hell's going on in Venezuela? What the hell happened there? Um, you know, how do people stand it? How do they survive? Uh, how has Maduro lasted so long, President Maduro? Well, they're, um, you know, very interesting and very good questions, and uh, I'll try to kind of get into some of the explanations as, as I've seen it uh, on the ground on lots of recent trips to uh, Venezuela. Um, and, you know, it, it really is a mess there uh, right now. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's gone from being a, uh, you know, a functioning but very flawed democracy and one of the biggest oil reserves in the whole world, a uh, place that uh, at times has been nicknamed Saudi Venezuela. Um, and now we've got a situation where basically it's turned into a, a, a functioning dictatorship. Um, there is hyperinflation that could hit perhaps 5,000% this year. Um, the Bolivar has completely collapsed. Uh, when I was in Venezuela in, let me see, when was that? Last year, maybe about nine months ago, uh, I tried to change $40. Too much money. If you stack forty dollars up on this wall, two twenties, it kind of comes up right here. Um, it took me a couple days to change it because it took a long time for the changers to come up with the bills because there's no everything else is in a shortage in Venezuela, so is cash. And uh, they just so happened to change my money into one hundred Bolivar notes, which, as some of you might know by now, a hundred Bolivar note is worth about one twentieth of a U.S. cent. So I got this huge backpack full of money, and, and it was really heavy, it was like five pounds, or something. and I was lugging it around, you'd go to the restaurant, you'd lug this heavy backpack around it. I stacked it up on the wall of my hotel, and I think the stack like, came up to about here. Um, uh, you sort of felt like you were in you know, Germany in the 1920s with the hyperinflation situation. Um, uh, I was over at the, the, the UCB, the Central University of Venezuela, you know, it's the big national university, 
I talked to a math professor. He's a doctorate. Uh, I think he was the head of the math department. His salary had shrunk to, at that time, about 50 bucks a month. Um, and most, many of his colleagues were uh, you know, fleeing to universities in Colombia and Ecuador and Chile and the United States looking for, for work elsewhere. Uh, that's, what's, you know, that's the brain drain that's happening in, in Venezuela. You know, the best and the brightest are, are leaving. Uh, some of you guys might be part of that, that exile group. Really. Um, big food shortages um, and uh, high crime, as, uh, as your professor here is an expert at. Uh, Rebecca's been looking into this. Uh, and then, you know, it, um, it's got, I believe, the second highest homicide rate in the world uh, 70 homicides per 100,000 is the latest data. Um, so now it, it kind of seems you know, it seems more apt to compare, you know, to the, the nickname for some people will now is something like Somalia than as well instead of Somalia as well. It's, um, but, uh, you know, I was there before all this happened. Um, and we have to go back uh, a couple of decades and look at when the Bolivarian Revolution started. There was a lot of, a lot of high hopes for this process. Um, Hugo Chavez back then was seen as uh, you know, this fresh face with uh, noble ideas. Uh, he was doing this new experiment. It was exciting. He was a charismatic guy. He was the first brown-skinned president in a nation where the presidents have mostly been you know, upper-class oligarchs. He pretty much had to be a white guy to get in to go anywhere in politics. Um, he really did seem like a man of the people, um, you know, without pretensions. Um, uh, I first met him on the campaign trail in 1998. I got on a charter plane with him in one of his campaign planes, as, and it was a little Cessna, and we were flying to some little town, and uh, we were doing an interview, and uh, the, there was a little there was a flight attendant on the plane, and she served us a couple of trays of lunch, and right as she did that, we hit a patch of turbulence, and our food trays hit the ceiling and slammed onto the floor, and there was you know, mashed potatoes and all kinds of stuff all over the, the floor. And I was waiting for Chavez to kind of call the flight attendant back to go, get in here and clean up this mess. We're trying to do an interview. But no, Chavez unbuckles his seatbelt. He gets down on his hands and knees, starts scraping up the food, and you know, putting it in the trash can. And you know, I don't think I'd ever seen a politician do anything like, like, like that before, especially a presidential candidate. So that was, you know, this, he was really cultivating uh, this image uh, that he was really different and he really was a man of the people and he was going to change things. He was going to give poor people more participation in the country. He was going to look after their needs. Um, and you also have to remember, and, and it's easy to forget, but at the time that Chavez arrived, Venezuela was also going haywire. Not as bad as today, but things were really on a downward streak in Venezuela. Um, the big oil boom of the 1970s, um, you know, by, by that time, by the, by the late 1990s, it had been pretty much squandered. Uh, many, many corruption scandals. Uh, oil prices were down to about $8 a barrel, so there was a huge economic crisis and growing poverty, and people were really disgusted with the status quo that really did want a big change. Um, and so, you know, Chavez was not following on the heels of great leaders. It wasn't Franklin Roosevelt who came before Chavez. It wasn't Winston Churchill he was replacing. He was replacing you know, people like Carlos Andres Perez who had just gotten uh, impeached for corruption. Um, so the bar was pretty low uh, when Chavez came in. Um, but all that said, looking back, we should also, uh, you know, we also should have kept in mind that uh, Chavez was a military man. He did not. Uh, doesn't. He didn't come really from a, a democratic uh, culture, so to speak. He got his formation in the military. The military is a pretty vertical organization where you take orders, where you give orders, um, and uh, you know that's that's where Chavez is from. And of course, in 1992, so when we first all heard about Chavez, he led a uh, failed military coup. Uh, a couple of dozen people maybe were killed in the coup and it didn't work. Um, he went to jail, he was pardoned, he came back uh, as a very creative politician. 
He was able to win the 1998 election by a fairly large margin. And, uh, you know, when he came back, he decided not to go the, you know, he, he decided, well, I'm not just going to come out be a dictator. I'm going to, you know, do this in a different way. Um, and what he did is uh, he kind of came up with a way, he kind of formed a sort of hybrid government where um, he wasn't really an outright authoritarian because under Chavez um, there were still elections and there were lots of elections. There were still nominally uh, three branches of power. Um, but it wasn't exactly like other democracies because a lot of the checks and balances didn't really work very well and more and more power kept getting concentrated in Chavez's hands. Um, and this recipe of Maduro's has, uh, you know, it didn't just change Venezuela, it's been a big influence throughout uh, Latin America over the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, governments in Nicaragua with Daniel Ortega, uh, in Bolivia with Evo Morales, in Ecuador with Rafael Correa, and the Kirchner family in Argentina, they've all taken parts of the Chavez recipe in order to uh, uh, manage some, uh, you know, fairly authoritarian governments in, in those countries. Uh, all these cases are different, of course, but um, they, they've all followed some of the elements of what Chavez did. Um, some of them were more successful than others. Uh, Ortega and Evo are still in power in Nicaragua and Bolivia, respectively, and are probably going to stay there for a while. Um, and now in Venezuela, as you guys know, Maduro's doubling down. He's become far more authoritarian than Chavez was. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a good bet, you know, Maduro could be around for a while longer. Um, so how did, how did, how did Venezuela go from here to here, uh, in this, you know, this 20 year period? Um, you, know, you think of dictatorships oftentimes happening through a, a military coup, uh, you know, an overnight thing, uh, in a, in a country like Peru, uh, it was Alberto Fujimori in 1992, it was the president himself who uh, did an auto golpe, a self-coup, and closed the Congress and decided, you know, enough with checks and balances, I need to get things done, I need to attack Sendero Luminoso, I'm going to do it, and I need authoritarian powers. Um, but then there are cases like Venezuela where it happens uh, gradually uh, through um, seemingly democratic means. You go through the motions of democracy, um, but you deliberately violate the spirit of democracy. Uh, and your end aim is to crush democracy. And, uh, you know, to me, in a lot of ways, it's, it's kind of a perfect crime, but uh, they managed to pull out in Venezuela. Um, to start this process rolling, uh, Chavez's first step came in 1999. Uh, he was he won by a landslide in the 1998 election. I can't remember the vote. It was something around 60 percent of the vote, I believe. Um, but a big, big win, and he used that momentum right away to change the constitution through a popular referendum. Um, and what the, the new constitution did is it, it concentrated more power in Chavez in the presidency, the office of the presidency, and later on. Uh, several years later, there was a constitutional referendum as well that would uh, eliminate term limits and allow Chavez and now Maduro to keep, to keep running for office. Um, it created a, a unicameral legislature, and that's important because if you have a, a bicameral legislature, if you have a House and a Senate, that's you know, uh, possibly you know, uh, two ways to balance some of the power of the presidency, but if you just have a unicameral legislature, now it's just a Assemblea Nacional in Caracas, in Venezuela, um, it's a little easier to control because it's just one body. So if, you're, if the ruling party is able to take control of that one body, body you've got the legislature in your hands. Um, uh, Chavez packed the Supreme Court. Uh, and another thing he did is he named lots of uh, temporary judges. So judges, rather than having uh, sort of long-term tenure job security, they served at the whim of the ruling party, so if they if their rulings went against what you know Chavez and the ruling party wanted, they could be let go pretty easily. So that's um, one of the ways that he's managed to control uh, the ju judicial system. 
Um, and the Chavistas also moved to take control of the state oil company, Pedevesa. Um, Pedevesa uh, used to be a pretty well-run state oil company. It was seeming to be uh, much better, for example, than Petrobras in, in Brazil. Um, but uh, Chavez really wanted to have full control over the oil company uh, in order to use oil money for social programs, use oil money uh, to pump into the economy ahead of elections so he could uh, keep winning elections and so the ruling Socialist Party could keep winning elections. Um, and that's a, you know, having control of the oil company is a big deal because 96% of Venezuela's export income comes from oil. The country really doesn't produce much else. Uh, it became this kind of cash cow for the revolution. Uh, there were really no more checks and balances on how the money was used or whether it was used for corrupt purposes or the correct purposes. Uh, they stopped pumping money into the oil industry itself and they, in new exploration and technology and safety. So the oil industry is pretty much going to hell right now. It's, uh, it's at the lowest uh, production levels in 29 years. Um, so that's part of the current economic crisis. They're just not pumping you know, the oil that they need. Um, and also, all this oil money allowed Chavez to send a lot of it out to friends and allies overseas. Uh, they sent a lot of uh, oil and oil money to Nicaragua and to some of the Caribbean islands, and that wins uh, the revolution uh, friends and allies uh, in the international community. It's one of the reasons why, uh, you know, trying to get in the OAS and the Organization of American States, trying to get any sort of a resolution to do anything about Venezuela has been impossible. Um, uh, so after, um, after all this has been done, uh, the one other thing, uh, you know, what's the other check, check and balance in a democratic society that we haven't mentioned so far? Some of you guys journalism students? Yeah. <laughs> press. Um, uh, what, what have they done uh, with the press in uh, Venezuela? Um, and you need a watchdog, you need a free press uh, in a democracy uh, because sometimes it's the last line of defense and a lot of times it's the press that's uncovered a lot of the big scandals in Latin America. Um, in the old days, what you did in places like Chile under Pinochet, uh, in Argentina under the military dictatorship in Argentina in the 70s and early 80s, uh, you know, you'd send in an actual government censor into the newsroom and he'd be censoring the news or you would send in the military to surround the printing presses or surround the building uh, to shut it, you know, just to, to shut down the newspaper. You'd simply close it. Uh, but today that kind of looks bad. It doesn't look very democratic. So let's figure out how we can do this, right? So how do they do it? Um, first of all, uh, in terms of television and radio, uh, the government just overwhelms the airways. Uh, the, the Chavez government that in Namalur, they They've um, formed lots of new television and radio stations. So now most TV and radio stations are uh, run by the government. They're nominally public stations that should be like PBS that you know, show lots of different things. But really, they've just become outlets for state propaganda. If you zap around the TV today in Venezuela, it's, 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 it's almost all uh, pro-government stations. Uh, the few independent stations there are, like Televen, um, they need to get broadcast licenses or transmission licenses. And so the government can threaten to withhold or not renew transmission licenses. And so technically, uh, for example, in, in 2007, RCTV uh, television station, um, Chavez decided not to renew its, its, its broadcasting license, and RCTV had to shut down. RCTV was extremely anti-Chavez, and Chavez hated the station. Um, some of the members of RCTV supported the, the the 2002 coup against Chavez. So Chavez, you know, he had good reason to be, you know, pissed off with RCTV. But, you know, he just said, "I'm not going to renew your license," and they didn't renew the license. So RCTV's gone. That was a, you know, that was a big warning sign to all the other TV stations, all the other independent TV stations in Venezuela. And so you, you better. I mean, there's some critical news, but. They don't go very far. There's, there's nothing like 60 minutes, for example, looking into uh, government corruption in Venezuela. Um, so that's what you do with radio and TV. Now, what do you do with newspapers? Um, 
When I used to go to Caracas, news, newsstands used to be jammed with newspapers. Caracas used to have, I don't know, like 10 daily newspapers. It's pretty amazing. You did come home to the hotel with a you know, sack full of newspapers to read, and it was pretty great. Um, uh, you know, paper boys would get backaches delivering El Universal and El Nacional because they were really thick with ads, especially the Sunday editions. Um, uh, El Nacional was, uh, you know, one of the big papers. Um, it, uh, you know, sort of maybe the local equivalent of, uh, you know, the Miami Herald or the New York Times or something. So El Nacional and El Universal were sort of the two biggies, and there was Ultimas Noticias as well. Um, but how do you control these guys? Um, first of all, the government carried out an uh, advertising boycott. Uh, lots of newspapers make their money in Venezuela off uh, state advertising. All that got pulled from any newspaper that was even slightly critical of the government, or at least most of it got pulled. Um, private advertising has also dried up due in part to the economic crisis. A lot of companies have simply gone out of business or they've been expropriated by the government, and so they no longer are advertising uh, in these newspapers. So what happens when a newspaper's ad revenue gets squeezed? You know, the budget goes down and they have to lay off reporters. El Nacional, uh, again, one of the biggest papers in the country, uh, they've had to lay off half their staff. So now they have half as many reporters to do any sort of decent watchdog work uh, covering the, the, you know, the, the Chavez and now the Maduro government. Uh, you can also hit uh, uh, journalists and editors with libel lawsuits, uh, you know, trumped up uh, defamation charges. That happened to Miguel Otero, who is the editor of El Nacional, and he's now, uh, yeah, there, an arrest warrant went out for him, and he's now editing the paper from, from exile. He does it over Skype. Um, and finally, uh, you know, what's the lifeblood of a newspaper? It's newsprint. If you don't have newsprint, you can't print a newspaper. So, um, newsprint is one of the many things Venezuela does not produce. It's all got to be imported, usually from U.S. and Canadian companies. Um, but what the government did is they took over most of the newsprint uh, importation and distribution. So now it's the government uh, that pretty much decides uh, where most of the newsprint goes. And obviously, the news prison, the news print is not going to go to opposition newspapers or independent newspapers. And so now El Nacional, that used to be about this thick on Sundays, it's down to 16 pages. And you know, you, you carry it around and a, a big wind comes up and the thing will blow away like a kite. Um, it's not only El Nacional, uh, in the last five years, two dozen Venezuelan newspapers have stopped printing. Two dozen. Um, of those two dozen newspapers, about half of them have simply closed. The other half uh, have gone online. And you might think, oh, well, maybe that's an advance. You know, everybody's getting their news online. Nobody reads the newspaper anymore except my grandfather. Uh, you know, who reads, who, who needs newspapers? Who, 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 who reads the things anymore? Um, you, know, you don't need the physical paper. That's a problem in Venezuela, though, because Venezuela has one of the very slowest internet uh, rates and speeds in uh, Latin America. So if you want to download uh, newspaper articles, uh, you know, multimedia presentations, that sort of thing. It's really slow, and if you've got, you know, your telephone and you're trying to download things, it's slow and it takes a lot of time, and, uh, you know, you might give up before the story of the downloads. Finally, you might say, well, what about the foreign press? You know, what about me? What about the New York Times? What about the Washington Post? What about CNN? Well, here's what happens there. Um, you can't watch CNN in Venezuela anymore. They've taken it off the air. You can't watch... Um, RCN or Caracol from Colombia, they've taken it off the air. Um, as for us foreign correspondents, um, we now need visas. A lot of times we don't get visas. Even when we have visas, they try to screw us over. I tried to go to uh, Venezuela last August, and uh, even though I have a visa to get in, they stopped me at the airport and said, uh, there was, it was the, I got there the day before a great big anti-government protest, so the government was kind of really on edge, and I came in from Colombia with uh, maybe three or four other reporters, and we all got stopped uh, by immigration control. Uh, they stopped us, they put a guard with us, they kept us there all day, and then they put us on the next plane back to Colombia. Um, and so it's getting harder and harder to, uh, for the foreign press to go to Venezuela and cover things as well. So now that the government has muffled the press, 
and they've uh, pretty much eliminated any checks and balances. That makes it a lot easier for the government to um, extend its time and power through seemingly democratic elections. Um, now, just like you don't really have to censor the press anymore, uh, outright censor the press, send up a government censor, shut down the newspaper, you don't really have to steal elections anymore. You don't have to stuff ballot boxes or uh, do that sort of thing, because again, it looks kind of ugly, you get some negative headlines, so you figure out a more intelligent way of doing these things. Um, so. The way you do it in Venezuela is you tip the electoral playing field in your advantage, well to the government's advantage, well before election day. Um, you know, it's, it's going to start, this process is going to start maybe six months before election day. Uh, first of all, you've got the media landscape totally dominated by pro-government media. Um, you have uh, what they call cadenas. Now these are... Uh, government transmissions where the government preempts regular uh, programming. And they take over all the stations where Maduro will get on television and they'll talk for three or four or five hours about whatever he wants to talk about. Uh, preempting regular programming in Latin America used to be done only in cases of national emergencies. A hurricane is coming, they want to tell you, you know, what to do. Maybe there was a coup d'etat. Um, you know, things that were really important that, you know, that the public needed to know, but in Venezuela they've just become uh, propaganda exercises and they can go on forever. I think you guys probably know how good Chavez was at talking for long periods of time. <laughs> Macarena, you know, it lasts through nine innings of a baseball game. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, uh, so you have cadenas that are used for electoral purposes. Um, you have un unequal campaign finance because uh, the ruling socialist party has all the oil money they want to run their campaigns. Uh, private enterprises, pretty, you know, there's so many companies, private enterprise that might be supporting the opposition. They're in pretty dire straits right now, and it's also difficult uh, to get any kind of to get financing from overseas. There's been a lot of new restrictions on that, so there's a big uh, disbalance uh, in campaign finance. Um, how about the electoral referees? Well, you probably guessed it, the whole Consejo Nacional Electoral is uh, four of the five uh, magistrates are, are, are chavistas. So anytime there's a dispute over how, you know, somebody complains, oh, the government's using a cadena to do government propaganda uh, to push for Maduro's re-election, uh, the um, Consejo is not going to do anything because they're pretty much in Maduro's pocket. Um, what else do you do? Well, what about those opposition candidates? Um, Leopoldo Lopez is probably, you know, everybody knows who he is. He's one of the most uh, well-known opposition candidates. Well, he was jailed uh, three years ago, um, and he's still under house arrest today, so he's not going to be able to run for president. We're, we've got presidential elections uh, supposedly coming up this year. Leopoldo's uh, in house arrest. Um, you can disqualify candidates, which has happened to Enrique Capriles, another a uh, very well-known opposition candidate who would like to run for president this year, but probably will not be able to. Um, so you do this, you can, you, by a process of elimination, the government will probably arrive on, at some kind of opposition candidate who they think is manageable, uh, you know, probably somebody they think they can beat, or if worse comes to worse, somebody they can sort of control if he actually does manage to win the election. Um, uh, and then there's also the issue of coercion, uh, the government using uh, government benefits such as uh, food handouts to the poor, which have become extremely important these days due to the food shortages. For a lot of poor people, um, you know, the, the, what they call the clap, which is a monthly box of government uh, sort of basic goods, beans and rice and that sort of thing, you know, that's really vital to them. And the government is basically going around and saying, you know, if you want to keep having this, you better vote for us. I was actually out with some uh, ruling Socialist Party folks uh, doing a census. This was back in July. They were going uh, into um, you know, some, some slums where people were basically, they weren't cardboard shacks, but they weren't much better. Um, I think it was at Cathy or Cariquado, maybe. Cariquado, yeah. Um, anyway. Uh, I was with these censors, and they were going in, and they were doing, you know, 
they'd spend a lot of time, they'd spend like a half an hour in each house, and they were you know, taking note of everything that the house needed. It needs a new tin roof, uh, the lady needs a new stove, God, the beds are in pretty bad shape, you, can, you need a lot of stuff. And they would basically say, they would just outright say, look, we're going to come back after the election and help you out with all this stuff, but we really need you to vote for the government. I mean, it's just blatant stuff like this. It's, we'll give you this, and you vote for us. And um, this kind of thing works because in normal democracies, governments are proud of the fact that the vote is sacred and the vote is secret. In Venezuela, the government foments the idea that the vote is not secret. And that way, if people think the vote really isn't secret, then you know they're going to be more likely to uh, you know be threatened by these you know by the government saying, "Look, I'm going to take away uh, you know your benefits if you don't vote for us," because you know they think the government's going to know who they voted for, and that serves the government pretty well. So anyway, you do all these things, you do all this long list of things over the six months leading up to election day, and then by the time election day rolls around. Um, you don't really need to do much because you know the bed's already been made, the table's already been set. Uh, but even so, you still do a little cheating, right? Um, and that's what happened uh, during the gubernatorial elections that I attended in October. I got there, it was election day. Um, I went to a couple areas that were opposition strongholds. And there were, and I went to the polling places, and there were all these people standing in these long lines of getting on buses. So what that's not, it's, you guys are supposed to be voting. Why are you getting on buses? What happened is that the government moved the polling places at the last minute on election day. So these people uh, in these sort of middle class opposition strongholds had to get on buses that drove them for half an hour across town, oftentimes up to a slum, and they had to vote there. And so that caused a lot of them to say, like, I'm not going to do that, or, or they got really ticked off about it, and, and so that helped kind of suppress the vote that day. That was one of the reasons that turnout wasn't so, so good that day. Um, and, and, you know, you could see uh, some of the results the next day when the returns started coming in. The government uh, came away with 18 of the 23 state governorships in October. It was you know, a very demoralizing situation for the opposition. Uh, pretty much the same thing happened in the um, municipal elections in December. The government came away with uh, more than 300 uh, of the, I think it's about 340 city governments, that were the, 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 the ruling Socialist Party took 300. Um, but to make it you know, at least seem a little bit more democratic than it actually is, uh, you allow, you do allow the opposition to win some posts, and um, you know you, you got to throw them a few bones, right? And that's what they do. Um, but once you do allow a few opposition politicians to win uh, a city hall, become the mayor, or become the governor, um, you make it impossible for them to do anything. It's impossible. Um, a good example of this is the 2015 uh, congressional elections for the National Assembly. Um, the opposition won a majority. They won uh, two-thirds of the seats. They won 112 of the 167 seats. Um, and it was the first time in 17 years that the opposition took control of Congress. And uh, so finally, it seemed that it was going to be kind of some sort of check uh, power, right? Um, so what happened? Uh, the government again, instead of doing kind of the, the kind of doing the, the sort of brutal old style thing of just deciding to close down Congress, what they did was they sabotaged the Congress. They undermined it. Uh, the opposition went forward and passed a lot of new laws. One to try to free political prisoners. Another to try to sort of extend. Uh, uh, the equivalent of food stamps, um, to do some more economic oversight, make some economic changes, and every single thing that they tried to do was declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. Uh, and because of that, uh, you know, the, the, the national, the, the, the Congress kind of came away with this reputation that they can't get anything done, they're a do-nothing Congress. 
and so it's, it's a do-nothing Congress, and we spent all this time campaigning to get these guys elected. They couldn't do anything. Well, why even bother, right? And that's another way that the government can try to suppress the vote, keep people from participating. Uh, you make it seem kind of like it's not really worth it. I mean, what's the point? Um, the other thing they do is um, when an opposition politician wins uh, a governor here for City Hall, um, the government, the, the national government, the Maduro government, and previously the Chavez government, they would set up uh, parallel governing bodies, parallel institutions that would have the real power. Um, <coughs> Uh, I think a good example is the Caracas mayor, Antonio Ledesma. He was, he's a longtime opposition politician, um, and he surprisingly uh, won Caracas City Hall. He was elected mayor in 2008. Um, but when uh, Antonio Ledesma tried to go down and take the oath of office in City Hall, he couldn't do it. Why couldn't he do it? Because a whole bunch of pro-government mobs took over City Hall, they threw, when, when Ledesma came down with his team to take the oath of office and take City Hall, uh, you know, they threw rocks, they threw tear gas, they were chanting, they threatened uh, his whole team. So Ledesma had to go take up shop uh, and set up the city government in this, uh, in this bank building in Caracas. I couldn't even find him. I, 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 w I was walking all over Caracas going, where the hell is the mayor's office? I mean, I went to City Hall, it wasn't there. Nobody could tell me where the mayor's office was. And it happened to be on the 23rd floor of this bank building in, Car in, a, in the middle of Caracas. And you know, there was no sign on the door or anything. And you know, inside, there's these people from City Hall and Ledesma working away. But you know, it, was, it was almost impossible to find the guy. Um, not only that, but the government took away almost his whole budget. Um, Ledesma, I mean, he was left with very few functions. I spent a day with Ledesma because I wanted to do a a profile on the mayor with no power. What does the mayor with no power do all day? What did we do all day? Well, we played basketball. I mean, <laughs> we didn't literally, well, what happened is he went to, uh, he went and inaugurated a couple of little basketball courts and a couple of slugs and he shot some hoops, but that's basically all he did. Because um, he didn't really have any other functions and he didn't have any budget. Um, the parallel agency that the government set up that has all the money and all the power the guy who was named to run this parallel agency was the guy who lost the mayoral election to Ledesma. So Ledesma wins, and they give the power to the loser. That's how things operate. Um, and finally, uh, you have the option of, if you do manage to win office, um, you can be arrested, or you can be threatened, uh, you know, threatened with uh, jail for corruption, or whatever, and that's happened to numerous uh, Venezuelan opposition politicians and mayors. Um, David Smolansky, who was the mayor of El Atillo, uh, just fled to Brazil. Uh, he, uh, he, went, he couldn't fly out because he knew they'd catch him at the airport. He tried to get out on a boat, but there were Coast Guard guys circling. So he ended up uh, going all the way overland down to Brazil. Um, and I think he put on, you know, funny glasses and a fake beard or something, so he really big because there's all these National Guard checking lights on the way down to Brazil. Um, Freddy Guevara's in the uh, Chilean embassy, um, looking for exile. He's in another well-known opposition politician. And uh, our friend Antonio Ledesma, uh, the basketball-playing mayor, um, he was thrown in jail. Later, he was allowed to uh, go under house arrest. Uh, but then he managed to um, escape from house arrest, or perhaps he was allowed to escape, and he made his way to Colombia, and then he flew to Madrid to be with his family. So he, now he's out of Venezuela. Um, and um, the reason I say maybe he was allowed to escape is because you know it's probably Maduro and the rest of the government is just as happy uh, to have these opposition players out of the country. I don't think they mind that at all. Um, and so, for all of these reasons, the opposition, as you, you probably know, is pretty demoralized and divided. And because of all this, Maduro um, is expected to take advantage of, of this situation probably uh, within the next few months by calling uh, presidential elections. Uh, he wants to do all the opposition is pretty demoralized, and that's uh, probably what he's going to do. Um, I guess I'm going to bring it to an end on that note. And that, 
not very helpful note of another <laughs> six years of my <laughs> But um, I wanted to open things up for questions. Um, I, I know there's, there's a million things you can get into with Venezuela. I haven't talked much at all about the sins of the opposition, but there are no saints either. Um, and we can get into all kinds of things, uh, you know, if you guys have some questions. So, with that. Yes? As for uh, regional cooperation, Colombia is not only culturally and economically invested in what Venezuela is doing, but also politically, like we've always been, even through Maduro ages, uh, or the Chavez ages, uh, are composing the Venezuelan government. So, what do you, how do you think that other regional bodies around Venezuela react to this? And do you think there's a possibility that they may be able to help change the situation? Regional bodies? Or regional states, say Colombia, oh, okay. say uh, Brazil, yeah. if things get to that. You know, um, a lot of the, the surrounding countries are pretty worried about Venezuela. I mean, Colombia's given all kinds of, uh, you know, Venezuelan refugees coming across. Um, uh, you go up to the border areas, and you know every day they're, they're just flooding across the border. Um, so Colombia is very worried. Brazil is worried. A lot of these countries are worried. But again, there's a long, um, there's a pretty long tradition of uh, non-intervention in Latin America that's still pretty strong. Um, it's the the uh, organization of the American states has really been sort of unable to do anything, even though Luis Almagro, the Secretary General of the Organization of American States, he himself has been. You know, very critical of Maduro and the growing authoritarian situation in, uh, in Venezuela. But I don't know. I mean, I, I think you know we have to hope that some of these governments try to have some influence. But up to now, it doesn't seem like they've, they've had a whole lot. It seems like uh, Maduro's kind of willing to pay the price of, of being an authoritarian. Say, what if the Uribistas in Colombia be in power and? You know, there's a very anti-left movement in Colombia. You know, um, you know, it's a good point. That, you know, some of the governments. Have, it used to be a, you know, for the last ten years, we've had what what they call the pink tide in Latin America. There's a lot of uh, left-wing governments taking over, and not not you know hard left communist governments, but more kind of the middle of the road left. Um, and some of those governments are now losing power. The, the Kirchner has lost power in. Uh, Argentina, so now it's the more conservative Macri government, Kaczynski in uh, Peru. Um, and, and they've been very vocally uh, critical of what's going on in Venezuela, but up to now it just hasn't made much of a difference. Um, I don't know, I, I, I'm a little bit skeptical that it will. I, I could be completely wrong. I've been completely wrong in my life about that thing since it will go away. Um, what do you think about? Not only regional intervention, but the American intervention in the first country. The consequences that that would have, um, and then especially, I would be talking about the US being so engaged in yeah. like, intervention. You mean like the Marines landing at White Man? Yeah. Um, you know, there was a uh, Harvard professor, Ricardo Hausman of Venezuela, and I think he was the former, what was he, former economy minister? Uh, back before Chavez days. Anyway, he's a, he's a pretty well-known Venezuelan intellectual, and he actually just penned a piece uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, kind of making the argument for U.S. military intervention in Venezuela. And, uh, you know, it was his, you know, some people thought it was about time that somebody came out and said something like that. But for the most part, what I saw that, that article was uh, created a lot of flack. And a lot of people just said it was a ridiculous idea. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think, um, I, think uh, I, I think it's a bad idea as well. Um, and I think, Venezuelans have to, you know, have to figure out what they want to do with their country, um, and you know it, it would be. And san and sanctions are pretty difficult as well. Um, I think the U.S. has been a little bit smarter about the sanctions this time around. They're trying to do targeted sanctions against Venezuelan officials um, rather than you know, you know things like uh, you know economic. Uh, Boycotts and economic uh, 
embargoes and things like that. Um, they're trying to do more targeted things that don't affect the average Venezuelans. But at the same time, even targeted um, sanctions against officials uh, can backfire because uh, now if you have Maduro and his, like his vice president, Tarek Aysami, um, I think the charges were drug trafficking against him. Was it drug trafficking? Yeah. So now you have your vice president, uh, who's basically a wanted drug trafficker in the United States. What incentive does Tarek El Aysami have to leave office now if he's wanted as a drug trafficker and an opposition government coming in could you know, decide to extradite him to the states? So you know, there's an argument to be made that some of these uh, sanctions are just going to make the, the government even more kind of, you know, duro and, and, and make them more abstinent to hang on to power, make them more, more, even more willing to hang on to everything they can. Yes? Um, You mean the the, the, the the lack of food, the food shortages? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, this has already happened to some extent. That you know, every now and then you have this spate of protests and riots and saqueos and, and uh, uh, looting. You know, and um, a lot of people think that rather than sort of organize protests, organize uh, opposition protests, what could really, if not bring down the government, you know, just kind of turn into sort of a general chaos and Caracaso type of situation. Uh, those were the riots back in 1989 over, I think it was gasoline, and they increased the price of gasoline and everything else went up. Uh, you know, lack of food has is, is been causing a, a, lot of, um, a lot of riots and a lot of looting, and that, that could become more generalized. I think, I definitely think we're gonna see uh, more of that, but you know, who knows if, if it's gonna be channeled into anything that's going to come to much other than you know chaos and the government you know, looking inept for not being able to control it. But every time I go back to uh, Venezuela, and especially when you get outside of Caracas, you know, little towns, you just see you know more and more problems with uh, with food supply. Yeah, it's really trouble. Uh, yes. Um, you mentioned the state of the Venezuelan economy and how it's plumbing. If you could maybe expand on that. Yeah. Or why it's so bad? Okay. Um, basically, the government is not um, yeah. the main. Uh, what do you call it? The main provider is run by the government. It's Cante, right? uh, it, it was private. I think. Yeah, it was private, and then it was um, the government took it over maybe in 2010, somewhere around there. So the government's the main internet provider. And they just haven't invested very much in new lines. You, know, you, get, you have to be upgrading technology all the time, and they have just haven't done very much of that. So you've got slow internet download, download times that makes it more difficult to uh, surf the web. You've got a lot of sites that are blocked. Mm -hmm. uh, you just can't. Uh, I think the latest. Or, do you guys ever read the Pitasso? It, it's a pretty good news website. I, I highly recommend it. Um, in Pitasso, though, uh, when I was there in Venezuela last time, it was blocked. You can't get it. Um, and the other thing is that they just passed an anti-hate law, a very vague anti-hate law. And the reason they did this is because there's no real, um, they've got laws about the press and TV, but they didn't really have anything specifically targeting uh, the internet. And so a lot of people see this as specifically targeting uh, both uh, news websites and uh, you know, social media users, it basically says if you insult the government or if you if you are caught fomenting hatred, uh, you can receive up to a 20-year prison sentence. But the problem is they just say fomenting hatred, you know, foment their rollo. And that is so broad that you could write anything on Twitter. And you know, be locked up for you know, conceivably be locked up because they, they, they don't really define what hate is, and so that's that's another kind of big black cloud hanging over internet users. You know, <laughs> you're not just going to hit the send button on your next tweet when you've got this, you know, the possibility of 20 years in jail hanging over your head if you, if you sort of make a mistake, a mistake and go a little overboard on Twitter. Yes. Um, I'm just curious, like, what is the 
as a journalist, uh, and given your experience in speaking with the voices amongst the op opposition, what would you say is like the most appealing or maybe pa palpable um, rhetoric amongst the opposition? What do you think is the most believable that we can, you know, spread amongst the population? What do you think is their, uh, the question so, is, with the opposition, on, what is their... What they hang on to, is it like grassroots, is it, um, you know, a piece like history, or is it like maybe the, the talks amongst the Mercosur leaders that, you know, you know, pressure uh, Venezuela on the, the geopolitical level? Yeah. Um, I think the opposition, um, it, it's a little hard to say because the opposition is so broad. Um, one problem with the opposition is you know, there's all these parties and they range from the hard left to the hard right. So it's trying to get all these, you know, it's, it's like getting frogs in a wheelbarrow. You know, you get a bunch and some jump out and they've got different ideas. So getting everybody on board with a single campaign theme and a single message is, 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 is difficult. Um, uh, before the talk, Rebecca and I were talking about, you know, how in a lot of poor neighborhoods, you know, a lot of the opposition people are just seen as really out of touch with the, with the needs of, of poor people. Um, and we, I think um, a lot of people are going to be more and more willing to vote for the opposition just as things get worse. Uh, but you can't just, if you're going to run a campaign, um, maybe as Hillary found out running against Trump, you can't just say, I'm against this guy, I'm, I'm against this. You have to be for something, and the opposition has had a very, very difficult time coming out and being for something. Uh, the good thing for the opposition is that, you know, having this enemy of Maduro is, is the one thing that does keep them united. Uh, but the bad thing is they haven't come up with a good coherent, uh, uh, you know, a good co coherent line of where they're going to take things. Uh, part of the problem is that anybody who takes over uh, Venezuela after the Chavistas is going to have a huge mess to clean up. They're going to have to raise gasoline prices. That caused riots in 1989. Uh, they're going to have to do a million economic reforms, and a lot of it's, you know, it's, 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 you know, a lot of it's going to involve maybe cutting back some of the social programs or, you know, it's, it's, it's just a huge mess. And so the opposition has been real coy about what they want to do, what they're going to do too, because they know that if they win, they're going to have to take some pretty difficult decisions. But, um, you know, I think they're, they're going to have to, uh, first of all, come up, you know, be united behind who their candidate is going to be in 2018. They still have time to do it and to get their act together but they don't have much time. Um, they're going to have to come up with a unified candidate and get everybody on board and stop their bickering and stop doing uh, what I think was a ridiculous decision in the last, uh, these, mayor, these uh, mayoral elections, but a number of parties boycotted them. We just set them up. Okay, bye. So I sort of have two questions. One is about something you did not mention, which are the colectivos, mm -hmm. the paramilitary um, yeah. kind of people. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of towards how does the government keep getting their way with the colectivos, which are violent groups of people that terrorize citizens. So it's, it's kind of on the personal side of your opinion, but mm -hmm. kind of is a broad question. Well, I mean, the, the, the answer to the government, um, they're, they're, they're pro-government and the government can send them out uh, to kind of raise hell. It'd be kind of like having... Uh, Back in 1969, the Rolling Stones hired uh, the Hells Angels to be in <laughs> security at, at one of their big rock concerts in Altamont, and they ended up killing uh, at least one of the fans. There was, you know, a bunch of problems, and the Hells Angels just went crazy. Now, it wasn't the police; it was <laughs> these motorcycle guys. Um, in, in, in Venezuela, uh, these colectivos, the government can can send them in, and they can raise hell and. Um, you know, intimidate uh, opposition protests, for example. Uh, a lot of the protests get broken up by these, these motorcycle gangs where people get intimidated so they don't want to even come out to the protest. But the reason they work for the government is because the government can then just wash their hands and say, well, that's not us, that's not the police, that's not the National Guard. It was, you know, maybe it was the opposition guys. Maybe they sent in some of their own people to do that. So it kind of gives a, a, kind of gives a degree of separation uh, for the government, it gives them, an, you know, gives them, uh, yeah, a degree of separation from what these guys are doing, and it's been pretty effective so far. Yeah. So I'm assuming that a lot of the colectivos that are have a long history in Venezuela um, are have for a long time had a lot of this ideology of collapse and kind of stuff, and shadow government. So one of the reasons why 
um, and oftentimes in cases the older point of view of just not very clear that there's direct collaboration between the government and political service, but there's an ideological connection um, that uh, sometimes is less important. And so the, the um, political ideology that long before Chavez even um, came around that kind of orients the cultural people still kind of connects them to the government and um, encourages them to turn out even without even kind of like direct collaboration. So if we did see them as just like an independent group that just boycotts towards like no, yeah. yeah. So I was actually working in the neighborhood where there is also a few of um, come from and um, at least like from what my research shows is that there's not a lot of direct direct collaboration. It's it, the quote of people is kind of operating so, autonomously um, because the government um, staying in power is in their own interests as well. Uh, and because they uh, the, this was this is the first time that the government's ever actually supported the court of people. I mean it's important it's, it's important to note that a long time ago the court of people originally started organizing because police violence and drug um, traffickers came into their community. So they were originally kind of like armed organizations to protect their own communities. All right, they've been around for a very long period of time with a very particular ideology and in particular child government, which is the first government that kind of recognized them as political actors. Thank you. And mm -hmm. just about Maria Corina Machado, which is another opposition leader. Mm -hmm. You didn't mention her. Um, yeah. So it's more kind of, do you see her as becoming a unifying leader, or do you think she has made No, she, she doesn't have much popularity. I mean, she's, you know, she's a, a pretty eloquent voice for the opposition, but polls don't give her a whole lot of popularity. I mean, guys like uh, Capriles and Henry Falcón uh, show up much higher on the on the on the polls and uh, Maria Corina, you know, she I think she was involved in the electoral boycott of, of the Congress back in 2005 and um, I don't know for some reason she just hasn't been as popular as, as some of the other leaders. So at this point, you know, may, maybe she will, but but at this point, uh, I don't think she's as you know as popular as some of the other options out there. Oh, and the other thing about the, the colectivos that Rebecca was mentioning is that, um, you know, um, the government doesn't have to directly order these guys to do anything. But if they go out and create havoc and you know, beat up opposition people and the government doesn't say anything against them, that just kind of encourages more of this sort of vigilante, right? this vigilanteism. And when things seem out of control with vigilanteism, it makes people even more scared of going out and protesting or saying anything against the government. I have a couple of questions. First, um, why do you think it is important to have this kind of thoughts? For example, for someone who is in Venezuela or is in direct effort to like Colombia, it's like a neighboring country. Why do you feel it is important to have these talks and how can these talks help? Which talks? Well, this this discussions about Venezuela. Like what we're having here. Yeah, like okay. the one we're having here right now. Um, I what the hell are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think it is. In, I I'm I'm a Venezuelan, yeah. so obviously yeah. I was going to come and see yeah. what what were you talking about, yeah. and um, I just wanted to know how do you think or feel these talks could help the Venezuelan diaspora? Like we have a lot of Venezuelan students here in Gainesville, but like not not mm -hmm. many people still know like. Yeah. You mentioned Venezuela, and they're like, oh, okay, that's so nice. That's like, what? Where is that? You know? Mm -hmm. So, how do you feel all these thoughts um, can actually translate into help or, I don't know, attention to the Yeah. Well, that's a pretty good question. Um, I feel the same way sometimes when I do, you know, my reports from PR, you think, well, is this going to make any difference? I and mean, you just don't know. Um, but I mean, it's it's it, for me, it's very helpful to hear from you guys too, and hear what interests you and what your concerns are about Venezuela and the other areas in Latin America. And it's just good to have a, you know, more knowledge about these more more debates about, you know, what's what's the way forward because nobody really knows. Nobody's come up with a solution yet. So you know, we can't do any worse here than what all the smart people. <laughs> I would just add to that, that you, as part of the Venezuelan diaspora and others in this room, you're part of the solution going forward. And so part of it is, is also being knowledgeable about the situation, letting others know, because the United States will will be involved in some kind of a regional solution. I, I don't think it's going to 
be a military intervention. Um, <laughs> but I can understand the desperation you know, yeah. where one would hope for anything, right, given how, how. But it's also important not to lose hope. There's many cases, you can look at Mexico. I mean, Mexico, when you were talking about the electoral mechanisms, that, that Venezuela used. I mean, the PRI in Mexico perfected these over 70 years, and it was in power for over 70 years. The perfect years. dictatorship. It was right? a perfect dictatorship. Yeah. It was voted out of office in 2000. Pinochet lasted much less time than that. And all of these dictators were removed through democratic means. But it also means that the opposition has to come together in a united way and offer a viable alternative to Venezuelans. And so you, as part of the, the Venezuelan diaspora and a family back in Venezuela, you're part of that solution. Yes? Um, on the less of the bits, I know what I really like. <laughs> <laughs> is, there, is there any chance do you feel that any possibility that the government might be able to be able to contain or at least lessen some of like the economic and humanitarian crises happening in the right now. The government's going to be able to contain? Yeah, or at least like lessen, like better the situation over time. I don't really see much evidence up to this point that the government is going to be able to do that. Um, I mean, part of the reason is uh, all the, you know, Maduro, the main thing that he prizes right now for his survival is loyalty from uh, the military, loyalty from government ministers. So all the people he's, he's put in power, um, you know, in charge of critical uh, ministries, uh, are loyalists who don't have much you know, economic training, for example. Uh, the head of Edevesa, the, the national oil company, is a guy with... You know how much experience in the oil sector he has? Zero. But what he does, what he is, is he's a National Guard general who was instrumental in putting down anti-government protests in 2014. So he won Maduro's undying loyalty for that, and he was just awarded last month by being named uh, both oil minister and head of the state oil company with zero experience in the oil sector. So how are you going to have a government like that that puts people like this in charge of vital industries like oil, which is everything, and think that there's going to be some kind of a solution? Yes? Uh, the, you and other members of the press. So when you know, Bono was arrested in, in 2014, yeah. Uh, yeah. What, it, it could be argued that it was kind of more like a martyr move, like he kind of turned himself in. From what? Uh, were you guys, you and other members of the press, not in the sort of press surprise that it's going to lead to more of the people going out and violently protesting. Because there was some protests, but yeah. kind of like not, kind of like sp spurring some more of a don't go home until this is resolved, or at least in the sort of yeah. thing. Um, I think it kind of had the opposite effect. It, uh, you know, people could see that you could get arrested, thrown in jail. Um, one of the problems with the protests and why the protests haven't led to any. Uh, meaningful changes is because um, the National Guard has come out and they beat the hell out of people, they've thrown a lot of people in jail, and people they haven't thrown in jail, they get hit up with charges for rioting, you know, trumped up charges for violence, and even though they're not thrown in jail, they have these legal processes over their head where they're not allowed to leave the country, they've got to go down and register with the government every couple of weeks, they've got legal bills to pay, and it's a huge, huge hassle. You know, you talk with people who were you know, weren't even, you know, they're involved in, you know, walking down the street protesting peacefully, and now they've got, like, uh, you know, they're being tried for being a, you know, a traitor against the homeland. And even if it's just nonsense, they have to go, you know, they have to go register with the government. Got this, this, they can't leave the country. I talked with a, a guy who, uh, <coughs> who had a, a scholarship to the U.S. that he had to give up because, you know, he couldn't leave the country because he got arrested for a protest. Have you talked to, have you interviewed the opposition leaders about that move, about the Leopoldo's move, and what they thought about it? Yeah, I mean, Leopoldo Lopez, um, he's, uh, at the time in 2014, uh, there was uh, a lot of controversy about, um, 
you know, whether to get whether you know the protests should really push for Maduro's ouster or not. And Lopez was seen as this kind of hardline, hardline guy who wanted to really push for Maduro's ouster. Capriles and some of the more moderate opposition leaders weren't really on board with that. Um, and so that's, that's that's also one of the reasons why the protests ended up uh, falling apart. So not everybody was up for it. Okay. No, I was going to say, um, we uh -huh. said this so much time, so I yeah. um, have a question for all of those of you who are actually in my class, if you wouldn't mind sticking around after this, so that would be fantastic. Um, and I think we can probably do two more questions, and then we have to get into more like the class stuff, unfortunately. And if you're not enrolled in this class, I'm pretty sure there's room, and it is drop bad. Okay. So remember no, that. You might tell them what the class is. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Rebecca, if you want to get going. No, 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 it's fine. I, I, guess, I mean, so we can do two more questions. Yeah, there's a lot of, yeah, yeah. This okay. class on law and order in Latin America, though, if anyone's interested okay. in it. We will be talking about Venezuela and Colombia, so. Um, okay. Two more questions, yes. Um, well, First of all, I value very much all that you're doing today because growing up I felt like there wasn't a lot of media coverage. Um, clearly you've been doing this for a long time, but many people like didn't pay attention to what was going on in the place of Venezuela or I um, feel like it still didn't get a lot of attention. Are you Venezuelan? Yeah. And you grew up in Venezuela? I grew up in, uh, in America, okay. in the United States, okay. and um, I feel like it, a lot of people didn't pay attention to it like other parts of the world. Do you feel like media coverage in Venezuela has been paid more attention to? Uh, stories coming like out of Venezuela? Recent, like in recent years, do you feel like a lot more United yeah. States people are paying attention? Yeah, yeah, just because, you know, because of all the problems, and, you know, bad news always attracts more readers than good news. <laughs> um, and also, I think one of the reasons is, you know, we talked about this sort of slow process of squeezing democracy. Uh, it wasn't, it wasn't, an overnight coup. It was a very slow process that has taken almost two decades to get to where we are now. And that's one of the reasons I think it hasn't generated as much uh, press coverage as it's made it to some But now it's getting a lot more. Yes. Speaking about press coverage, um, what about other movements in other countries getting press coverage not in Venezuela, but to the Venezuelan aspect? Like you said, like for example, like the movement in Argentina, or I don't know if you paid attention to Guatemala. There's there was a revolution in 2014 uh, that ousted. It's good. Yeah. Uh, so, well, how much has that like influenced? Do you think uh, the mindset of, of the opposition? Do you think they've taken? But at least they, the, the opposition has taken part from. They feel like they have more support from the OAS for to do something about Maduro. They uh, they've taken part from Macri and Kuczynski. I mean, I don't think, has, has Guatemalan government come out and said anything about? Uh, I mean, no, yeah. they're pretty confident. Okay. But... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one thing that the opposition does has managed to do. Um, I mean, they they. they it's, it's a long history of failure, the opposition, but what, one thing that they have managed to do lately is get the, a lot of the international community uh, on their side. It hasn't led to much changes, but that's, that's given them a big moral boost. They always talk about that. They say, you know, that, you know, things are changing. People now realize that this is really an authoritarian state and something has to be done. But that's, that's where we are now. That there's more recognition of it, but it felt like this is. But anyway, you guys, thanks very much. Thank you.